The really interesting thing about gorillas is that up until recently they were actually considered a single species and they were considered to be three subspecies. Now we have them split into two species with four subspecies. So there's four different types of gorillas. So basically they're divided based on where they are in Africa. So there are the western gorillas and those have two subspecies. One is the western lowland gorilla and that's the type of gorilla that you see if you go to a zoo. And then there's the cross river gorilla which is not very much is known about at all. There's only about 300 of them left on the planet. And then in eastern Africa or sort of central Africa there's the eastern gorilla and the two types there are the Grower's Gorilla, which only is found in Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and then the Mountain Gorilla, which was made famous by Diane Fossey in the movie Gorillas in the Mist. What always amazes me when I think about Diane Fossey going to study gorillas in 1967, so here's a woman that goes off to Africa by herself to study gorillas, and when you think about the perception of gorillas at that time, it was very much King Kong, these huge, aggressive, mean animals. And one of the things that I think was so pioneering about her work was that she got to know about gorilla social life, the same way that Jane Goodall got to know about chimp social life. And what she taught us was actually that image is completely incorrect. And the nickname that we give to gorillas is actually gentle giants. Now obviously they can be aggressive if they need to defend themselves or their families. But overall, a gorilla group in an average day, you see very little fighting. Part of it is their diet. They have food available everywhere, so they don't really need to fight over food the way that you might see in, in some other types of species that have more defendable food that they want to get at and fight. Gorillas are, of course, the largest primate on Earth, and they're possibly the largest primate that's ever lived. Uh, they have a few competitors in the fossil record for that title, but a male gorilla, 400 to 450 pounds, and a female gorilla might be on the order of 250 pounds. And they're, they've often been called, kind of sarcastically, the cows of the primate world because they're big. They spend a lot of time eating green vegetables and, as far as we know, essentially completely vegan. They, they sometimes have been seen to have the opportunity to eat say an injured baby antelope on the trail in front of them and they, and they ignore it. Gorillas are the most vegetarian of all the apes. Western gorillas tend to eat a lot of fruit and fruit tends to be really widely distributed and so they actually have to travel quite a distance maybe to go from one fruiting tree to another. So they tend to range over larger areas. Mountain gorillas on the other hand, they basically live in a big salad bowl. They have food almost everywhere around them and so their travel distance can be very short because they can basically move very quickly from one food patch to another. But but for the most part, they spend a lot of their day eating. A male gorilla can eat up to 50, 60 pounds of food a day to be able to keep that, that big size on him. So a lot of their day is spent eating, and then a lot of their day is spent resting and digesting their food. The average gorilla group is usually about 10 individuals, and it's usually comprised of a single dominant male that we call a silverback. Every male gorilla becomes a silverback. It's a process of maturation, the same way that humans mature and their male shoulders get big and they get facial hair. When gorilla males mature, they get a silver crest on their back. And so there's usually one male, multiple females, and then their offspring. The silverback will live with a group of females, but he's not really in control of them. Uh, he may try to be, but actually females kind of drive the gorilla mating system by migrating between groups. Females are the, are the moving unit, so females transfer between groups. And so a lot of times we think that there's something about the male that they find attractive, whether it be his size or how well he displays. And so a female will move from one group to another. And it's the silverback's job to protect them and help them get integrated. Because obviously he benefits by having a new female in the group because now he has a new uh, potential breeding partner. One of the things that always makes me laugh about gorillas is they're very stoic and they have these very, very straight faces and they don't communicate a lot with facial gestures. So they communicate a lot by sound. And so what you'll hear if you're in a gorilla group is kind of this constant communication. And then the males have these very impressive displays that they'll do when they're showing off to a female or to another male and they'll beat their chest, which is you know, something I think most people are familiar with with gorillas. But they have air sacs that are located underneath their chest and so it makes a very resonating popping sound that can actually carry quite a distance. Learning the lifespan of something like a, a gorilla or an ape because they live for such a long time is really difficult. The Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund has been studying gorillas in Africa since 1967 and we are just now starting to get an idea of their lifespan. So we're just now getting to the point where we've seen gorillas born and then that same gorilla live to pretty much what we would consider very old age. 
So the oldest male gorilla that we know of in the wild lived to be 35 years of age, and the oldest female is in their early 40s. And what's very interesting is in captivity, we see that gorillas can live quite a bit longer. So here at Zoo Atlanta, we actually have a male gorilla that's 50 years old, and we have a female that's 52. So captivity seems to add potentially up to a decade onto their lifespan, or even 15 years um, as compared to the wild. And it's probably because they have access to really good, high quality food all the time. They have veterinary care, so if they have injuries or get ill, they have vets that take care of them.